We've got a lot more to cover, but I want to open it up to your questions. You've been waiting for Eric all semester, so now's your time to ask the questions. Amanda, you got a mic? Raise your hand, say your name. We may not be able to get to all of them, okay, but you'll get to meet Eric okay. at the end. All right. Uh, my name is Ken Lazani, a business major. Um, going back to the idea of opposing views, what have been the most memorable changes you've made, done to Activision due to opposing views, especially as the company got gotten bigger and bigger? It's well, the company's pretty big when I got there, to be, to be fair. Um, so uh, it's not about it getting bigger and bigger, but it's, it's, it's really about um, inviting debate. Probably the best example I had was we had a leak uh, of Modern Warfare 3 last March. And it was sizable. You know, there was a lot of stuff that someone got a hold of somehow. And we didn't know how it happened. And this is serious stuff. You know, it's like they're giving away levels, and they're giving away plot lines, and they're giving away things that weren't set to be revealed for quite some time. And as you would expect, you know, uh, the, the company kind of, you know, went into triage mode, and, and everyone got in room. And, and this was a kind of heavy moment. It was one of those moments I described before where it's like, now, which day of art school did I sleep through that would have prepared me for this? Um, <laughs> But you know, there's literally like you know, there's guys who who are security guys, and, and, and they're trying to figure out where the leak came from, and and uh, and everyone who works on the business is sitting around the table, and um, what I I had this moment of clarity where I realized all of our focus was backwards. All of our focus was how'd that leak happen, and it was all trying to figure out what that was. And so what I did was I kind of split it into two meetings. I said, okay, the guys who are responsible for figuring out where the leak came from. You know what you're doing. Go do your work. Update us you know, when you find something out. The rest of us, we're not going to talk about that because our launch just started. Whether we like it or not, our game just launched. <laughs> and it wasn't on our schedule, and we didn't start this. But here's our job today. Our job today is to finish this sentence. If this leak had never happened, we would never have been able to do blank. And the several hours that ensued was every opposing viewpoint you could imagine. Do nothing. Stay the course. This is a tiny vocal minority of the population who's even aware of this leak. You know, we should, we should do our own leaks. We should do this. We should, you know, it, we tried on every different angle. And where we ended up was simply acknowledging that we live in a digital connected world. And that in that digital connected world, the, the most valued value is transparency. So we just went, we're lucky with you know, Activision, we have a huge social media you know, network. We can talk directly to fans. We have 10 million fans on Facebook. We have a you know, uh, huge amount of Twitter followers off various accounts and 2 million YouTube channel subscribers. So we just went directly to our fans and released a statement that said, as you might have noticed, <laughs> this leak happened. We didn't, it you know, didn't come from us. It's not intentional. But because this seems to have stirred up some interest, we're going to lean into it. And so we, we were lucky with the time because we had four teaser commercials that were scheduled to launch about four weeks or three weeks later that were done. And so we said, so here it is, you know, the official uh, teaser campaign for Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. We released those. And there was an analogous set of videos that were released a year earlier for Black Ops. And if, you, if I had the chart here, it would be very uh, demonstrable. But you know, the YouTube views were here for Black Ops, and they were like, here for the Modern Warfare 3 videos. So by leaning into it and by sort of pouring gasoline on the little fire of interest that got stirred up by the leak, we were able to 10x, literally, uh, multiply our engagement with our teaser materials. So I think that was a good example of sort of inviting a debate, inviting opposing points of view, and, and collectively coming to the right place. Hi. Hi, my name's Asher. And um, I'm curious how you say you encourage discourse. And especially in a company of your size, how do you get projects moving forward and not bogged down with like f f uh, arguments like <laughs> consistently? Like, how do you unite behind like a single vision? Um, so, the page in this book that says the battle for the best idea is followed by another core value that says this. It's a very important issue that you're tapping into, which is if you invite discourse, it can go, it can go on infinitely. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you have smart, passionate people, opposing points of view can win the day, you know, and you can never agree. Um, it's really important that there's a moment of decision and that you 
create the expectation that once that decision is made, once the debate time is over, we go into execution mode, we all get behind it, and we push. And you push in, if the idea is yours, give it away to everybody else. If the idea isn't yours, get behind it like it is. And that's how, you know, that's how success happens. And well, that doesn't guarantee success, but the absence of that does guarantee failure, in my opinion. Hi, how's it going? Uh, you touched on branding a little bit earlier today, but that's a very important topic, especially in the future, I think. But, uh, you know, I get that branding requires, you know, understanding your company's core values and stuff like that. But a lot of us are trying to start like a new product or service. What particularly would you do to try and like create the next Activision or Apple or something like that? I know it's a huge question, but I figured I I'd give that. my time. <laughs> <laughs> um, particularly with a new product. I think the answer is really the same. Um, I think that they're, that great companies, and I'm not talking about great liquidity events. I'm not just talking about building something to sell it and then, you know, how many of those, how many of those startups are really built to last? So building something great that's lasting and meaningful, I think will always be built on, on a set of core values. Not just in your corporate culture, but in your product. Like what, what thing are you bringing to the table that's new and differentiating? And I think you've got to be really hard on yourselves to answer that question before entering into an entrepreneurial venture. Because I think the entrepreneurial spirit, particularly in this country, is so strong that the idea of starting and owning is almost taken over from creating something meaningful. And the, entrepreneurial's idea, the entrepreneurial ideas that, that work are the ones where something created something meaningful that solves a problem that people have, that brings a new flavor or a new point of view uh, or a unique contribution to the marketplace. And if you have that, then articulate it, build your company's values around that, and you'll be successful. But I think the, the, the hard part is having that. If you have that, the rest will fall into place. Hi there, my name is Ben Prophet. I'm a filmmaker. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, first I want to acknowledge like, uh, how, how much I admire your creative and technological achievements in what you do. Um, but also in, in inviting opposing viewpoints, uh, this is something I worry about as a filmmaker. Uh, especially with how engaged people are with your products. You know, you're saying it's some people's full-time or part-time jobs. Do you ever worry about what you do is a distraction? Is, uh, you know, people are wasting their time, you know, to the, point of, to the point of not doing something productive. I think, you know, obviously video games are something hugely valuable and fun and, uh, you know, stimulating. Uh, but do you ever worry about that you're actually too effective and how, <laughs> how, how engaging your games are? It's a great question. First of all, you don't have to worry about uh, being a filmmaker because your name is Ben Prophet. Yeah. Proudfoot. So, Proudfoot. Proudfoot, even better. <laughs> Either way, you're going to be successful. The world needs a director named Ben Proudfoot. Um, I, uh, I don't worry about that um, because, uh, first of all, I think that games uh, this is a several pronged answer. Games are a young industry. If we were the movie business, we wouldn't, the movies wouldn't be talking yet. That's where we are in the arc. So because of that, it's still viewed with a lens of exoticism by a lot of people and held to a standard that like movies aren't or mu popular music isn't anymore. But those things were seen as dangerous when they started. Movies were seen as dangerous. Rock music was seen as dangerous. Rap music was seen as dangerous. Books were seen as, as dangerous when they were new. And um, change is hard, and people have a hard time assimilating it. So people who didn't, generations who didn't grow up playing games often look with a skeptical eye at games. The data is overwhelming that games not only don't have a negative effect, you should watch a, a TED talk, you know, uh, TED.com, a woman named Jane McGonigal, a PhD, who studied games and their effect on people and, and realize that gamers are some of the most engaged, focused, uh, empowered people uh, of any type of entertainment that you can consume. And that's because I think games are the only form of entertainment where you fail about 80% of the time and have to, it's the only form of entertainment sort of arrogant enough to say, you might not get to finish this. <laughs> we don't know if you're good enough. We know you bought it. But you got to put in a little more time before you get to see how it ends, you know? So, like, people who play games are one of the few things kids do where they single task. One of the few things. They don't single task when they're watch, watch, watching movies or television anymore. They're on, you know, their, their iPads or smartphones, tweeting and, and texting. Uh, 
So I think games are a really uh, great art form and a great uh, form of entertainment. And, um, and I think that like anything, of course there are cases where you can take a good thing too far and that undoubtedly happens with games. But I think the vast majority of, of, um, of gamers you know, uh, are doing it the right way. And if, it's, if they're wasting time, I think it's time well wasted. <laughs> Hi, my name is Carly. Um, so I know that Activision Blizzard is owned by Vivendi, which I only know because I was an intern there this summer. But I was wondering if you could talk more about that relationship and like how it affects uh, the Activision. So um, Activision Blizzard essentially merged um, a couple years before I got there. And um, with that merger came a uh, significant investor in Vivendi. And, um, I've been through a very similar equation when Deutsch sold to a company called Interpublic, Interpublic Group of Companies, which sounds like a Simpsons company to me. <laughs> um, but IPG, they're a big holding company that owns hundreds of ad agencies and Deutsch sold to them. And when you get uh, into that kind of relationship, it just adds another layer of rigor and another layer of scrutiny and another layer of um, input into the process. And I think that can be very healthy. I think that, um, uh, Knowing that you have board meetings coming up, knowing that you have earnings calls coming up. Like I said about writing the values book, it sort of makes you stop, figure out how you're going to present what's going on, you know, figure out what your case for you know, growth is and, and building the company the right way is. And, and there's a, you know, an audience that's engaged and, and smart that's going to scrutinize it. And I think that we should all invite that. Hi, my name's Keyshawn. Um, recently in the media, a uh, executive from a little known company named EA um, said they wanted to see the Call of Duty franchise rot to the core. From um, the core, I think you said. From the core. <laughs> from the core out. Um, yeah. What would you say to the competitive landscape and how do you see it? Uh, if you know that quote, you probably know that my response to that was to not respond. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll just say this. Uh, it's a challenger brand's job to get people to think of them in the same way that they think about the leader brand. And that's what that strategy was. Uh, you pick a fight, you know, uh, you guys are all too young to remember the Pepsi Challenge, but there was a famous ad campaign called the Pepsi Challenge where Pepsi Challenge Coke to a taste test. Well, Coke doesn't need the Pepsi Challenge. <laughs> They're number one. They never mentioned Pepsi. Okay, so um, our competition is ourself. And when your last year's you know game was the biggest entertainment launch of all time, that's what I'm worried about topping. Um, and that's tough enough. So I, I really d I've said this a million times, and I really, but I really mean it. And people think it's like a, a shtick or like a like a public facing um, answer, but. I really think focusing, uh, the way you win races is by focusing on the, the, the finish line, not on the other runners. And you just got to do the best you can do and make something great and be hard on yourselves and be hard on each other and push and push and push until you think you have something great. And that, you can't, you, any energy you waste talking about or thinking about what someone else might be doing, which you can't know anyway, is wasted energy. Um, as you said, the gaming industry is one of the fastest growing industries, um, I, and I completely agree. What would you say is one of the biggest voids of the modern gaming industry, and what is Activision doing um, that you can speak to to fill that void? Well, I obviously can't speak to any you know, projects that haven't been announced yet, but um, uh, one of the things I think we're doing is trying to take our core, what we know how to do well, and using new technologies and new media to expand those universes. So the Skylanders game I talked about for kids, there's an iOS app and an Android app that kids can play the game on their parents' smartphones and they can teleport the toys into the phone. There's a web world. You know, so it becomes a sort of like community. And we've done the same thing with Call of Duty Elite, you know, trying to create more of a, you know, the observation was this. People are spending all these hours and all this time playing Call of Duty, and yet there's remarkably few ways to actually interact with each other. Now, layer on top of that, what's going on in our culture right now, where the zeitgeist idea is social networking through digital media, it seems like those two things should meet one another and shake hands. You know, Here are all these people in a digital space, 20 million a month, playing a game that they all love. 
and there's no way to connect with each other. There's no way to control who you're going to play with next or join a, a league or join a competition. And we just wanted to kind of experiment with how far we could take people's willingness to connect in, in a new way with games. I, I think that games have a lot more in common in a weird way with sports than they do with movies. I think people always like to compare them to movies. But I think that the, the games have in common that we spend a lot more time with them. There, there's a lot more engagement with them. You're trying to get better at something. So I think that if you think about the NFL, the NFL happens only on Sundays. But you can interact with it 24-7. You can play fantasy football. You can watch highlights shows. You can read blogs. You can read stats pages. You can you know, obsess over it every day of the week. That's an ecosystem of content around one passion, which is football games. So we're sort of seeing if we can use all this explosion of new media and new technology to, to do that with the games that people love. Because they really are universes that people inhabit. All right, two more questions. And don't diss my side over here. Well, <laughs> that's going to be a problem. I have these three more questions. <laughs> okay. uh, hi, Eric. My name is Spencer Colwick. Um, I, like many of the people in this room, are sort of children of the internet age and competitive gaming and esports has sort of grown out of that, which your company is a big part of. Uh, I remember growing up and having a lot of my greatest accomplishments that I was most proud of uh, were sort of my parents couldn't connect with. And I couldn't connect with them. Uh, they were really proud if I won a tennis match or played a piece on piano, but the things that I was that. Yeah, but the things that I were most proud of didn't really mean anything to them. So I was curious uh, how you thought the sort of aging of this this generation of gamers who are who are playing online games who, and who are able to see gaming as sort of a, a positive thing in a, and uh, in many ways much similar to sports. How you see that affecting your company? Um, well, I spoke a little bit before about the sort of cultural disconnect, generational disconnect that people have with games, and they still see them as this kind of you know subversive element in in um, in culture. And you know, I remember when we did that Black Ops ad. Um, I can't remember which commentator it was, but someone on ESPN kind of went off on Kobe and said, what is he doing holding a gun on television and there's, you know, there's real wars going on in the world and what was he thinking? And I remember, you know, uh, I actually think I said this in the press, but uh, I remember thinking to myself, well, would he be saying that if Kobe had a part in the next Born Identity movie? <laughs> you know, there's just this kind of, this is someone who didn't grow up playing games. And they see it as this, you know, exotic, you know, kind of thing. That won't happen. That's a ge just a generational time continuum. And we're in the middle of it. And I think that one day we'll look back at the controversy of video games and, and find it quaint. I mean, you know, at the time, uh, there were people who blamed Charles Manson on the Beatles because they wrote the song Helter Skelter, which he referenced in his writing. Or comic books. Or comic books, you know. So um, I think now we look back at that and we, and we you know, they're the Beatles, <laughs> you know. Um, and games will eventually you know, occupy that kind of you know, pillar seat at the pop cultural table. But they don't yet. Still, young, still a young medium. All right, two more quick ones. We're going to go a little bit late because we got started late. If you okay. have to leave, leave, leave very quietly. But I urge you to stay <laughs> Hey, Eric. Uh, my, oh, continue. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, hi, Eric. Uh, my name is Chris. I just had a couple quick questions. I was wondering if you had one. any, or one. that's that, all I meant was one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you had any stories or experiences where you kind of struggled against adversity, kind of like where you were cramming and putting that table together last minute for that constant conference <sighs> meeting, uh, just because I didn't have hear much so about that. many of those stories. <laughs> okay, you said you're not going to tweet this, right? Yeah. You'll probably have to cut this part out of the video. <laughs> so. Um, Commercial we showed at the beginning of the thing, class. What is this? <laughs> Lecture, discussion. Um, OK, so we're less than 24 hours away from filming that commercial. We're in the what's called the pre-pro meeting. Okay, It's the meeting with the director and the production company. You're going over every shot. You're going over every, every angle. You're trying to get all your ducks in a row so that the shoot goes smooth. It's a four-day shoot. The cast for the commercial at that time, 11 AM, the day before 7 AM start time, was Jason Statham as the vet and Aziz Ansari as the noob. <laughs> True story. Jason Statham backs out. 
Uh, I'm sure he had his reasons, but we had, you know, nine days of back and forth with his, you know, talent management, and they were assuring us he's in and the money's fine and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And um, <laughs> that was a big problem, <laughs> you know? We had this, you know, shoot. Pete Berg directed that commercial. You know, Pete Berg, the uh, movie director of Friday Night Lights, and, you know, big production, helicopters and explosives and, you know, pyrotechnics, and we got no star. Aziz Ansari is already on the set, getting trained with the weapons and the, the wires, you know, in the zero G scene in the plane. He doesn't have any of that training. Jason doesn't need that training. He has that in spades. Um, and so we go into, you know, good enough isn't mode. We go into, you know, overdrive to try to start replacing this actor. And um, in the middle of that crisis, the phone rings and Aziz Ansari's people want to triple his fee. And the, uh, the reasoning was, well, this was very different when it was two stars, and now it's one star. He's the only star in it, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, we had backups, of course. We had, like, you know, uh, there was, like, an ex-Navy SEAL stuntman guy who could play the, the vet, and there was an up-and-coming comedic guy who could play the noob, and they were sort of, like, you know, triple-scale type actors. Um, but we wanted celebrities. We wanted it for the you know, reasons you saw on the screen, the, the sort of you know, pop cultural relevance they brought to it. So this was one of those moments where I just had this one huge problem that I didn't know how we were going to solve. And now we've got this one too. And um, so we said, thank you for your kind offer. <laughs> but we declined <laughs> to triple his salary, um, which didn't go great. Um, but, you know, they said, well, we'll back off of, you know, the triple salary thing, but, you know, Activision needs to make a gesture. They need to do something. <laughs> so we did something. We cast Jonah Hill. <laughs> um, and we actually got Jonah Hill casted before we got the vet casted. So in the meantime, while we're all trying to recast the commercial, the, uh, the production company's figuring out how they're going to do the whole first day of a four-day shoot without any actors. So they're shooting all stuntmen from behind, and they're shooting explosions, and they're shooting you know, kind of plates and, and set pieces and stuff like that. And so the whole first day, we did without any lead characters. And we got Jonah Hill booked. Um, the way we got Jonah Hill booked was Bobby Kotick, who runs Activision Blizzard, and he's the guy who recruited me for this job and hired me, had just had a cameo appearance in Moneyball. He played the owner of the Oakland A's. And he became friends with Jonah. And so he hooked me and Jonah up on the phone. We pitched him the idea. And he's like, sounds awesome. Let's do it. And he was in, you know. <laughs> so we called Aziz and said, thank you very much. Your work here is done. And then 7 a.m. the next morning, this was a big, you know, kind of good enough isn't moment. We sat down uh, and said, OK, who's going to play the vet? And within, b between 7 a.m. that day and 7 a.m. the following morning, we went through every possibility. You know, could Colin Farrell do it? Uh, I don't know. You know, uh, Josh Duhamel will do it. Mm. He's on General Hospital. I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, you really can't put this in the video. Um, I'm being really open now. Uh, and, you know, finally it was like Sam Worthington. Now, Sam Worthington was a voice in Black Ops, so he had a relationship with the, the company already, and he was totally into it. And we pitched it to him. He had three days in LA between movies the three days that we needed. And you know the clouds sort of parted. And at like 11 PM the night before the second day of the shoot, we locked that deal down and got it done. <laughs> I'm exhausted just retelling that story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what, there what? Is a, Dwight Howard was already in. Thanks. We already had him. He was great. <laughs> Woo! There is a great <laughs> lesson, though, in that, which is don't hold a gun to people's head. They don't like it. <laughs> and even when you think you have leverage, don't. Like, it, it, that doesn't mean you have to use it. And usually, when you do, people respond exactly the way we did, which is the, you don't want to be in that position. You don't want to be in a position where, where suddenly someone's taking advantage of a situation that there's no fault of your own, it happened through you know, circumstances. That's not good business. And when you get in those moments, you think opportunistically, and it crosses everybody's mind. But that's a big mistake. Would have been good. Would would that not have been good for Aziz Ansari's <laughs> career? Yeah. I think it would have been. Last.
question. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Hi, my name is uh, Anthony Trenkin with the Marshall School of Business. Um, quick question uh, with uh, regard to like Activision Blizzard. Now, I understand that Call of Duty is trying to be released in China itself. And how are you trying? What's your main challenge with connecting with the audience in China as you're going forward? So we are we are taking the game to China, and um, and it's a very uh, it's a great gaming market. People play a lot of games. It's all PC, you know, online gaming there. So we've got to we've got to essentially develop a, a new game that's that's based on a lot of the stuff that we have for the console games for Call of Duty, but it's um it's a very different you know style of gaming. It's microtransactions based, and um, so we have. Um, we've been working with a, a partner, and a lot of how you do business in China is find the right partnership, because it's a very different market and it's a very different way of doing business. And you need someone who can, you know, have some skin in the game who's going to try to help make you successful there. And so um, we we're working with a partner, and we're trying to, you know, figure out how how to do it. Now this is an interesting story though, because Call of Duty is already viewed if you do if you do uh, research in, in China as the number one premier. Uh, first-person shooter game in China, it's never been released there. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those rare moments when piracy plays in your favor. Now, as soon as we're in business there, then we'll be like, ah, no piracy. But right now, it's like, okay, we're going in with like 98% name recognition, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Don't have that problem. Great question. Great questions. Give yourself a hand. Great questions. Great answers. That is, uh, that's a master's class on so many topics. I really, we, we could go on for hours. Unfortunately, the students have other classes and you actually have to go home to your family at some <laughs> point. Uh, so we won't keep you. But I want to finish with one question and I want you to stick around if you can uh, because this is an important one. Um, Amanda, you, you have that photograph ready to go, right? Um, so, no, this is a serious one. <laughs> we, we've talked about values. We've talked about what's important. You've got, you know, 18 to 22 year olds in the audience thinking about what they want to do next and how they want to live their lives. And so we really like to really focus on the important things. Um, Marie did send me this picture uh, of a piece of artwork behind your desk. And I want to show it to everybody, Amanda. And then I want you to explain what it means to you. So um, the story behind this piece of art is um, the day I left Deutsch. Uh, and you have to imagine this. I worked at Deutsch for 14 years. I started the agency with a partner. I, you know, it was my baby. I grew it from five people to you know 430. I think the day I left, and um, it was a lot to leave. You know, you don't usually people who build a company don't leave them. You know, um, and it was a very comfortable place for me to go to work every day and I had a lot of great friendships there and a lot of pride. And Marie had told me that um, that they were preparing a bunch of gifts, some of them funny, you know, gag gifts and some of them, you know, heartfelt and there was going to be a roast toast kind of thing uh, to send me off because I wasn't going to a competitive agency. It wasn't the kind of thing where I was leaving on bad terms. It was very, it was a very surreal experience. It was like kind of being at your own funeral, like you hear all the toasts and hear all the things that people say about you, but I'm like, but I'm here still, you know, like. Um, <laughs> But I decided that I didn't want them to just give me gifts that didn't feel right because they, Deutsche had given me so much too and, and had been such a great you know, growth opportunity for me and, and such a home for me. So I gave myself the assignment of trying, I wanted to come up with something. The, the sort of brief I gave myself was if I could have one wish for the thing that would have to continue after I left, that I think we got right when I was there, that would ensure future success, what would it be? And I wrote these three words, care the most. And then I created this silk screen. I actually found uh, the guy who helps Shepard Ferry with all, he's like his studio assistant. And he, he's the only guy in LA that does these giant silk screens. And that's a huge silk screen. And I created two, one of which hangs in Deutsch and one of which hangs behind my desk. And then I destroyed the screen. And um, the idea is really simple. Um, the people who I know, in the world who are the most accomplished and who have the, the careers and accomplishments that I admire the most, don't all have you know, the, the biggest set of, of, of God-given tools always? I, not to minimize the importance of talent and intelligence, those things are important, but I think they're the cost of entry. Talent alone is not enough because everyone you're competing with in business 
there will be lots of other talented people. And the X factor to me is caring the most, sweating every detail, never being satisfied, pushing beyond what you thought you could do and what your team thought they could do. And it also means caring for each other, caring for the work product, caring for the culture the most. In my experience, the ones who care the most win. And I don't care whether that's a professional athlete, or whether that's a business person, or whether that's a creative person. I think that's the X factor, and that's the secret ingredient. And it's certainly how uh, I've accomplished whatever I've accomplished in life.